Ma'am, unmute your mic. Ma'am. Thanks. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to the session on Christian history and missions. Uh, I hope I'm audible. Is it clear? Yes, ma'am, you're audible. Okay, great. So let's uh, begin the session on journeying through the book of Acts. Today we would be covering the second chapter from the book, Revival's Visitation and Moves of God. So request one of you all to please start the class with a word of prayer. Yes, Jafida, please go ahead. Dear Heavenly Father, we come to you under the name of Jesus. Uh, we thank you for this beautiful day. And God, we surrender ourselves. We give our mind and heart to you. Help us to listen to everything Pastor Diana teaches. We bless our Pastor Diana. And I bless every student. And I praise each one of us in your hands. Lead us and guide us. Help us to understand that we are Holy Spirit. We welcome you uh, as we read each and every word, as we go through the chapters. Uh, let our mind uh, keep getting larger about you, God. We place everything else in your hands. Give us the good network that we need and take care of all our needs. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, Jeffina. <clears throat> so last class, we studied about the revivals and, you know, the introduction to revivals, how, what happens in the revival. And we also uh, uh, studied on the quest, the urge that one should have for the revival to be birthed. So today we're going to study on the second chapter where we're going to see how the early church was birthed in, how the Holy Spirit moved through the early church from the book of Acts. So the book of Acts records approximately 40 years of such visitation and the move of God. And we see the outpouring of God's Spirit in Jerusalem on the day of Pentecost. So what happened on that day? There was a supernatural power of God ministered to that 120 uh, disciples, believers who were gathered in that hubbub. So the outpouring of the Spirit became a habitation of God among that community of believers. And see the fire spread from Jerusalem across Asia Minor into Europe and all the way to the capital of the world, which was Rome in those days. So we see that the book of uh, Acts records a various instances of the move of the Holy Spirit. So we, we will go chapter by chapter so that we can cover every instance from this book. So the very start of it, in Acts chapter 1, verse 14, we see that the book of Acts opens by the Lord's ascension, following where 120 disciples spent 10 days being in one court and in continuous prayer. So what happened? What was the outcome of that prayer? What, what was the outcome of that prayer? In Acts 2, we see there was a rushing wind and they encountered the power of the Spirit, each one, uh, 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 you know, they fell at the tongues of fire. The Holy Spirit came upon them, the tongues of fire. So when there is one God and one mind, you see there's an outpouring of spirit. So two points we can take from this. There were one God, there was unity, there were one in heart and mind when they were united. Second, there was a continuous and a collective so these are the two ingredients that we can take for the birth of the mobile. You see the outpouring of the Spirit, they had a purpose. Purpose to empower the disciples who were there in that upper room. And later, these disciples were simple men and women who were filled with fear, who were, uh, you know, who were filled with fear, who did not have the knowledge of God, were now bold. They now had the knowledge of God. They now have the courage of God to go and witness about Jesus Christ. And they went forth and they witnessed to the ends of the earth. 
So there was a supernatural phenomenon that took place in that city where the city had, uh, generally the city was about uh, one lakh residents uh, residing there, but then due to the feast of Passover and the feast of first fruit, they were about five lakh people visiting Jerusalem and here you see the right time the spirit has witnessed among these disciples and here these disciples are bold and courageous and speaking up we see where uh, where Peter was filled with the Holy Spirit and he ministered to them and in one day there were 3,000 people received Jesus as their Lord and Savior. And they all were amazed and they all were marveled about the way the disciples were preaching and sharing the word of God, the knowledge that they carried with them, the power that which through which they demonstrated. People were amazed and perplexed. At the same time, others were uh, there were others who were mocking at what was happening there. But those who believed, those who believed, witnessed the power of God in them. So the Holy Spirit moves among the believers. Those who believe will encounter God. Those who believe will witness the power of the Holy Spirit. With that, we will move on to Acts chapter 2. What happened? Yes, there was a sound of rushing mighty wind. And we see the tongues of fire. And uh, the disciples ministered in other languages. The disciples ministered. And the people who heard them, heard them in their own languages. All this was supernatural for them now that could happen only by the power of the Holy Spirit. So there's an important lesson here that we could uh, learn from here is the outpouring of the Spirit. And the Holy Spirit will do as He desires in each outpouring. It, it, it need not be the same each and every time that there's a revival or when there's an outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But then the Lord desires to minister to the set of people how He wishes to minister. So we cannot put God in our box and ask God to minister just like that. But then the Holy Spirit desire to minister to people in the way. So we see the purpose of our study. Uh, in the book of Acts, we can divide that into three sections. The first section, we see that the first eight years highlights the outpouring of the Spirit through the community. And we need to understand what it looked like in a church, in a, in a community of believers, how this revival was birthed in, in the first eight years. But after that, next 10 years, we see how one community, how a community can spark this revival and raise up several other communities. And we can learn how this revival fire sparked and spread through other communities or other believers in the small church. The third, we see that next 20 years, it provides an insight into the life of man. One encounter. Paul, who had one encounter with God, how he became the carrier of that revival fire. And what we can learn from this, how each of us can be that carrier of that revival fire in our time, in our place where the Lord has called us to. So let's look into the first eight years. First eight years can be from AD 30 to AD 38, where the church was birthed. So we see that in Acts chapter, it covers Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 8. These first eight years are covered from Acts chapter 2 to Acts chapter 8, where we witness the Holy Spirit was poured out on 120 believers on the day of Pentecost. See the work of the Spirit that ministered through Peter was able to save 3,000 people in the very first sermon that Peter preached. And from then on, we see that many community of believers were added on to the church. We see that in the book of Acts where it says, Lord added many people to church. Where Lord ministered to them and added many believers to church. 
And in that response, we also see later there was a lame man from birth who were healed. And this very incident stirred another 4,000 people to be added on to the church. There were many people who continued to serve. <clears throat> Sorry, just give me a minute. Sorry, excuse. So what we see here is through the ministry of the Holy Spirit, many people were saved and the work of the Spirit continued very powerfully among the people who believed. And what was the fruit? What was the outcome of this outpour of the Holy Spirit among this community of people in Jerusalem? Let's look at the impact that the Holy Spirit had among these communities. The very first is many souls were saved and brought and added into the kingdom of God. So when we, uh, if somebody says there's a revival or even if we are experiencing the revival, we need to see the fruit of the Spirit. Is Are these things happening? That which happened in the early days of the uh, early days, of the early church, is it happening now? Are they souls been added? Are people been convicted of their sin? And are they been saved and added to the kingdom of God. Second, we need to see, is there a steadfast teaching, fellowship, sharing and prayer in the house of God? We need to see, are the people in the community have a great fear or a reverence toward God? And if this is happening, we know that the Spirit of the Lord is moving among that community. So this is what happened in the early church. There was a great fear, great reverence towards God. And the disciples just did not minister to people by the word, but then they also demonstrated the power of God through signs, wonders, and miracles. And there was a great grace upon the people, which affected the whole city. We also see the boldness that these disciples had to carry and minister towards people. And at the same time, they also faced persecution from the other religious leaders. But <clears throat> what we see is that did not stop the disciples from ministering to the people. The community just went on sharing the word unselflessly. They were so selfless that they went on sharing the word. There was a great unity. They prayed together. They were one God, one heart, and one mind. They influenced uh, the people to spread the word of God from one place to the other. They carried the word of God out of Jerusalem. And they all ministered with signs and wonders. They were, uh, uh, when they, when they were oppressed by the other people, you see, they experienced the angelic visitation bringing deliverance and instruction to the disciples. We also see there was peaceful and there was wisdom being resolved during the disputes and problems because they all seek the Holy Spirit to come and minister to them. And there were people being raised up you know, in faith and wisdom and power to do great signs and wonders among the community of people. And they were also leaders been raised. So in eight years, we see they were, uh, they raised disciples who could carry this uh, revival fire through the word and spirit across other cities, across Judea, Samaria, Galilee, just as it was mentioned in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, you shall be my witness in Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the earth, in Jerusalem, and to the ends of the earth. Yes, this is what happened. We see how the disciples carried from one place to the other, the, where the gospel of God, Jesus was shared among the believers. And they saw God's divine intervention uh, affecting the people in high places. Just like how Philip ministered to the Ethiopian eunuch. And how God, uh, by his divine nature, ministered to Saul of Tarsus. 
and just that one encounter of Saul changed his life and it became the carrier of the word from one place to the other throughout the Mediterranean, how he became the carrier of the gospel. After that, we see the next 10 years, how this revival, this revival fire, how it spread. So in eight years, in Jerusalem, it spread it. In the nearby cities like Judea, Samaria, Galilee. And now, the next 10 years, how this revival fire will be carried out of Jerusalem. What happened? There was extreme persecution in Jerusalem. Where the disciples had to scatter had to scatter. Now what happened? When there was a persecution, did they stop ministry? Did they stop sharing the word? No, it was just like God stirred that revival and telling them now it's time for you all to go out, go to the ends of the earth. So this resulted in the disciples carrying the revival fire and spreading out wide. So the community of disciples were raised and they all carried the same spirit, the same DNA, which was ministered to them at the Church of Jerusalem. Now, these communities were experiencing a mighty, a mighty move of the Holy Spirit that they could not keep it for themselves. But then they moved out, sharing the word. And so, in AD 38, we see that Saul encountered the Lord. Probably he was about 29 to 33 years old, and Paul went. <clears throat> what did he do? When he encountered the Lord, he was strengthened by the disciples in the new church, and then he went out ministering to other places. He went out uh, places like, uh, you know, uh, the northwest of Jerusalem, which was located in the, uh, towards the highway of Egypt and Syria. And these churches also are thriving and experiencing the supernatural power of God by then. And we also see what happened. There was a divine intervention as God spoke through a vision to a Roman centurion. And this opened the door of gospel to the Gentiles. And we see Peter, the Lord ministering to Peter to carry the gospel and go to the Roman centurion house and pray, share the word and baptize them. So here Peter is witnessing how the Holy Spirit is ministering to the Gentiles as well. So now the door for the Gentiles has been opened by the Spirit himself. Till then, Peter and the other disciples were only ministering to the Jews. But now the gospel has been shared to the Gentiles by the Lord himself. So more leaders were raised up in Jerusalem church like Barnabas, Silas and Agabus. And Barnabas was sent to take care of the church at Antioch, which is also, uh, we see that the church grew in Antioch powerfully and they were the first people who were called as Christians at Antioch. And later, we see how the ministry grew and the churches were birthed in Jerusalem and other places. And we learned several lessons from this, from the church in Jerusalem. That the church in Jerusalem grew in word and in spirit, and they raised many believers and leaders. And they believed God to open new doors of opportunity for them to share the gospel in the unreached areas. And God, as they believed and prayed, they did witness, they did experience the divine intervention of God. Uh, uh, you know how God intervened and stopped Saul and uh, Saul's life was changed through that and then we also see when uh, Peter was in the prison God said uh, when uh, when the community of believers prayed we see how God sent an angel uh, to deliver Peter from the prison and there were new leaders been raised and uh, you know through them the church was strengthened and uh, uh, they ministered to the other places we also see Luke, who is the author of the book of Acts, 
was most likely a Greek who lived in the city of Antioch in Syria. Luke, by profession, he was a physician. The scripture was silent, uh, or the scripture does not tell us like when, where, and how Luke was saved, or he came to faith in Lord Jesus Christ. But then, this is what it says, that Luke was with Paul. Luke was with the other disciples. Because in many instances in the book of Luke, he writes, we, that he was with Peter, he was with Paul. So the next 20 years, we can look into the next 20 years, that is AD 48 to AD 68. Now what happens? Initial first eight years, we saw how the Holy Spirit moved among the disciples in the city of Jerusalem and ministered to the nearest cities like Judea, Samaria, and Galilee. And next 10 years, we see how the church was birthed in Antioch and other places and how they grew stronger in word and in spirit. And they all moved in the demonstration of the Holy Spirit. And there were various leaders been raised by now, like Paul, Silas, and Agabus. Now we are moving to the next phase, that is the next 20 years. So in next 20 years, we, we get to, uh, that is from Acts chapter 13 to Acts chapter 28. Sorry, when we study the second part of 10 years, we also see how the Holy Spirit opened the door for the Gentiles to be ministered. Okay, so now with that, we are moving on to Acts chapter 13 to Acts chapter 28, where we get to know about Paul. Just the one encounter, what Paul had on the road of Damascus, how it changed his life and how this the fire of revival has been birthed in him and how he becomes the carrier of the what we're going to see from this chapter. So the rest of this Acts, that is from Acts chapter 13 to Acts chapter 20, it focuses on the journey and ministry of the Apostle Paul, how he spreads the gospel around the Mediterranean Sea and into the different parts of Europe. Let's look into the key points of his early life. As we just said, Paul was converted on the road of Damascus and he was about 29 to 33 years approximately. And Paul immediately started preaching. As he spent time with the apostles and leaders, he learned, he started witnessing, he started sharing his conversion story among the other believers at the synagogues of Damascus for a short time. And then we see that Paul goes into Arabia, which at that time, uh, was uh, was part of the Nabataean kingdom with the purpose of preaching to the Gentiles. We get to read that in the book of Galatians chapter 1. Then we see Paul return to Damascus for the rest of the three-year period. He continued to stay with the disciples to be strengthened by the word and spirit with them and also at the same time share his testimony and preach the good news at the synagogues there. And later we see how the Jews and the other agents of Aretas, the ruler of Nabataean kingdom in Arabia, attempt to find about Paul and arrest him because he is being the spread of this Christian, the new religion that they called them. So Paul, with the help of other believers, escapes from Damascus and he travels to Jerusalem and he stays there for 15 days. Now, what happened? What happens in Jerusalem? In Jerusalem, we see that Barnabas, he meets Barnabas and Barnabas introduces Paul to the other apostles who are there. And in this season, Paul stays with Peter for 15 days and he learns much more from the disciples who witness Jesus, who spend their time with Jesus. And during his stay in Jerusalem, Paul spoke boldly in the name of the Lord. He engaged in debates with the Greek, that is the Hellenistic Jews. And when the disciples, because this was spreading, 
as Paul was very bold and he witnessed with all his power and might with what he had experienced the power of God. And this was creating a much more impact for people to receive Jesus as the Lord and Savior. And the spread of Christianity was, was increasing in the city of Jerusalem. And then the disciples get to know the plot that was plotted against Paul. So they quickly, uh, you know, they quickly uh, uh, make some arrangement to escape Paul from that place through a ship and send him to Tarsus, which is hometown of Paul. Now there is a silent period of Paul's life. Maybe six to ten years, he goes to Tarsus and he remains silent there. We, I mean, the scripture does not record what happened to Paul in this 10 years, but we believe that he would have spent more time in the word and in spirit through which he got the revelation to write one third of the New Testament. So what happens later? The church in Antioch grows. The church in Antioch is growing. And when Barnabas was ministering to the church in Antioch, as the church was growing, he, see, he, he realizes that he needs an assistant to serve in the church at Antioch, which is in Syria. Now, there are two Antioch. One is in Syria and one is in the other place, Pisidia. Okay, Pisidia, I'll, I'll come across it later, that place name. Okay, so now we're talking about Antioch of Syria, where Barnabas is ministering. So Barnabas suddenly has been remembered about Paul. Now who reminds him? Definitely the Lord. The Lord reminds Barnabas about Paul. And now Paul goes all the way to Tarsus. He finds Paul and brings him to Antioch, saying that I need your help. Come, let's serve together. Now Paul and Barnabas serves at the church of Antioch for over uh, about over a year together. Now we see Paul's life from different perspective. He's a leader, he's an apostle. Now we look at Paul uh, being the carrier, the more of God's spirit, a carrier of the revival. So what we learn from his life and ministry is what that you and I can you and I can carry it in our life. We can experience the same more of God in our life when we seek God earnestly with the urge of being the carrier of his word. So we see that Paul could not content himself and stay just at Antioch, but Paul comes up with this idea saying, Barnabas, come, let's spread the word. Come, let's go on a missionary journey across the Mediterranean and share the gospel, plant churches. So they go on the first missionary journey. Approximately the date is recorded as AD 44 to AD 46. So in the book of Acts, we see that Acts chapter 13 to Acts chapter 14, verse 28, it's been recorded about Paul's first missionary journey from Antioch in Syria the New Testament has been carried from Antioch in Syria and to Antioch of Pisidia. Okay, so what happens? It has been referred in Acts chapter 13 that Antioch in Syria is called as the home church where most of the three missionary journeys have been started from the home church of Antioch in Syria. So they go to different places from one place to the other and share the gospel. So they go to the, uh, uh, you know, they go, uh, uh, Paul and Barnabas, they go uh, to Rome and to Alexandria. They go to some of the royal places and minister to them. And now in Antioch, we see just not Jewish people residing there. There were other community of people who had influence on Antioch, like Jewish, Greek, Roman, Arabian, and Persian. So what happened here? The ancient Antioch, which was which is now a Turkish city located uh, located in Turkey, has been influenced by these two leaders. 
to the leadership team that raised up Antioch Church, you know, the raise them with the word, with spirit, and with demonstration of the Holy Spirit. They experienced the, the power of God in them. So there were five leaders from this Antioch Church were raised. They were named as prophet and teachers of Antioch. Who are they? Barnabas. Simeon called Nica, Lucius of Cyrene, Manian who had been raised with Herod, and Saul who's known as Paul later. So their names were, uh, they, they, though they were from different social culture and ethnic background, but they were great leaders. If you see the background, Barnabas was a Levite from Cyprus and he was trained and raised up as a leader in the Jerusalem church. And if you see Simeon was nicknamed as Niger or Black, it is unclear whether he was an African or he just had, the, had a dark skin color. But he was a Jewish. See, at Lucius is from Cyrene and Cyrene, and he was probably a Gentile believer, he was part of the Cyrene, Cyrene from a Jerusalem. Uh, where um, Cyrene group, where the, the gospel was first preached in Jerusalem, he encountered Lord in that meeting, and he was later raised to be the leader. And later we see um, Manian, which means a comforter, was brought up by Herod the Tetrarch. Herod was uh, the Herod we read in the gospel, like he must have been raised, Manian must have been raised in the royal courts, but later he encountered. The, uh, the, he was encountered by the Lord through the gospel that was shared in, in Jerusalem. So he later was raised as a leader from a royal court. And of course, about Saul, we know that he had an encounter on the road to Damascus and how Lord raised him. And later we see that how he was raised as a leader to the Gentiles. And we see among these five leaders, we see more about Paul's uh, Paul's work, how the Lord moved through Paul. So when we see that, we see the first missionary journey, which took about two years, where Paul and Barnabas journeyed together, and they covered about 1,200 miles. Paul, Barnabas, and also John Mark joined them, who was Barnabas' nephew, joined them, and they set from Antioch of Syria, to you know, different places they covered Seleucia, Salmis. You can go through those names in the book, Cyprus, and we see Path Pathos, and each and every place where they went and ministered. You see, they, they minister to them the word, they shared the gospel of Christ, they also shared, demonstrated the power of God. Many were healed, and you see, people thrived in number to hear the word of God. So what happened? The places where they went and ministered to, like Seleucia, Cyprus, and Prathos, is about quite very far places from Antioch of Syria. Now when <clears throat> they were at Prathos and they were at Pathos. John Mark was along with them. You, he saw this journey was too hard that he could take it. Maybe he had <clears throat> different kind of fear. So we see that once again. Sorry, guys. I'm just clearing. Okay. So we see that John Mark goes back home. He leaves, uh, he leaves Paul and Barnabas and he gets back home. This upsets Paul. But then this does not stop Paul from doing what God has called him to do. He continues to journey with Barnabas from Pathos to Perga. Then they travel on land about 100 miles to Antioch and Pisidia. And we have a record of Paul's message at Antioch where many believed the gospel. And then what happened? The Jews 
who did not believe raised a persecution against Paul and Barnabas and they expelled them out from Perga. Now we see from <clears throat> now we see Paul and Barnabas again travel from that place to 60 miles east, which was the capital city of Lyconia. So in this city, uh, uh, in this city again, many believed, many believed they came to the knowledge of Christ. But what happened? And uh, as many believe, there was a crippled man from birth. He was healed. And this led again to another burst of people encountering God. So people, the Jews who did not believe, who did not believe, uh, you know, at Pisidia and other, icon, uh, other places, they formed a gang and they came to Iconium and came against, uh, against Paul and Barnabas. So we see that in Acts chapter 14. Literally, they attacked Paul by throwing stone on him and dragged him out of the city, considering him to be dead. They were very good in stoning. So they know when a person dies, they know. So they considered Paul is dead and they drag him out of the city and they left him there. So what happens? We see in Acts chapter 14 down, maybe 20 or 21, we see that disciples gathered around him over the night. That's it. That verse does not explain much more. But we know what would the disciples do gathering around. Okay. They would have just prayed. What happened next morning? The person who was stoned to death gets up, continues his journey, goes along with Barnabas to Derby to minister to them. He, walk, he goes again another 20 miles by land. And then he ministers the gospel to them. Nothing can stop Paul from sharing the gospel. No chains, no stoning a person to death. And after ministering at Derby, he decides to go back to the earlier places. Because, uh, because of persecution, they left that place in a hurry. So now they decide, Paul and Barnabas, let's go back to the places where we ministered to. And then we will strengthen the believers, appoint leaders, so that the work that has been started can continue to grow. So Paul and Barnabas decides again to go back on their journey. Till Antioch. They, they, they visit every place every place where they planted a church and they raise leaders there. And later we see how Paul writes to each one, to each church a letter, inquiring of their growth in Christ. So we see Paul and this uh, team being ministered by the power of the Holy Spirit working wonders, and how the gospel of Jesus Christ was spread towards other places around the Mediterranean. So after the first missionary journey, but, uh, you know, uh, they stay, Paul and Barnabas stayed in Antioch for about three years. And then we see uh, the, the council at Jerusalem in AD 49. And we, here we see a new entry of a leader, the young man called Titus, who was nurtured, who was ministered, uh, Paul ministered to him. He was nurtured and uh, he was nurtured by Paul and then he grew. And here in the book of Titus, chapter 1, verse 4, we see that Paul addresses the Titus as his son in the Lord. So we have no record in the New Testament that, uh, you know, what instant, when, where, and how Paul led Titus to the Lord. But then here we see he's been nurtured by Paul. So what we haven't recorded is. Titus was with Paul, Barnabas, uh, and others in the Antioch of Syria. And at the end of the first missionary journey, we see that Titus uh, was also part of the Jerusalem Council. And uh, to look at the background, Titus was a native of Greece. 
and and he was a gentile by birth and he was residing at antioch of syria and he served along with Paul at Antioch. This is the information that we could gather from the New Testament. And we talk about the Jerusalem Council. Now, what was this council all about, which took place in AD 49? Anyone from the class? What was the main, uh, main reason for this council of gathering? There were some crucial issues been addressed there. Can anyone say what are those? Yes, Rebecca, please go ahead. It, uh, it was all, all about some of the cultures of the, the Jews, especially circo, uh, circ is it, no, circumcision, circumcision and some some foods so there were some issues between the jews and the gentiles whether a person to be accepted into christianity should circumcise and uh, about some kosh foods so that was the major reason about what was supposed to be discussed at jerusalem thank you thank you Lubeka. thank you so much yes you're right yes so the main reason of this jerusalem council at ad 49 was now we have believers we have believers jews as the believers and they were also gentiles added to the church when there were two believers coming together jews wanted even the gentile believers to be circumcised and follow the jewish customs in order to be saved for which paul was not for it so now there was a kind of dispute among or uh, confusion among the believers. So they all gathered for a council at Jerusalem. Now with the leaders, under the leadership of, who was the uh, leader for this, uh, leader for the church in Jerusalem during this period? Anyone from the class? James. Yes, James was the leader of the Jerusalem church. So under his leadership, there was this council uh, prepared and gathered together. And we see other disciples also been there. So they all seek the Holy Spirit. They all prayed and asked the Holy Spirit to give them a proper solution. So that will be the peace for everyone. And we see that Paul and Barnabas, along with the other leaders, discuss these kind of dispute between the Jews and the Gentile believers. And when they all prayed, seek the Holy Spirit for the right counsel. And they all brought their own instances, like how the Holy Spirit ministered to the centurion and even the Titus, who was not from a Greek background, you know, uh, he was also a leader there. When, when they seek the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit ministered to them and he gave them a, 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 a right kind of counsel. He said, people have been accepted even without the circumcision. You don't have to follow the same culture and, uh, you know, uh, uh, the other customs in order to be saved. So in Acts chapter 15, verse 28, we see that this seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us. So whatever the council decided about the circumcision and uh, uh, not, not all the Gentiles had to be circumcised or, you know, or we need or it's not the Gentiles need to follow the Jewish customs in order to be saved. When there was a decision made, there was peace. There was peace among all the leaders and among all the believers in the council. So this was the decision that brought great rejoice among the Gentile believers through this council. And this council was another breakthrough for the revival to spread among other places and carry the good news to the other Gentiles without any hurdle. So 
before we move on to the second missionary journey, we can stop here and ask the class to share how the Lord has been ministering to you or what are the new things that the Lord has taught you from the book of Acts as we study and move on. You can take this time of five minutes to share your learning among others so that you know all of us can learn and journey together. Over to class. Um, I really loved uh, the missions of Paul, like how he was restless, like he keeps working, moving to places, and he does. He did everything that he can for God. And that really inspired me a lot. And while you were preaching, uh, teaching the class, you said the Holy Spirit does as He desires, and that touched my heart a lot. So that inspires me to do whatever I can for God right now and just surrender to His will above. Even though sometimes we, we are like, I want to try something for God, do something for God, and then sometimes we put all these uh, efforts on ourselves. We keep believing on ourselves, but that should not be like that. Too. Even though we have a great desire to do for God, we should surrender to His will and His desires. I'm very really inspired as we are learning about the Bible and that ignites a fire in me to do great things for God. Amen. Thank you, Jeffina. Is there anyone who would like to share your learning, your understanding, or any, any insights from the Book of Acts that you would like to share with the class? Okay, as I don't see anyone raise hand. Okay, let's end the session with a word of prayer. Dear God, we thank you that you are in midst of us. You are leading us and you are guiding us by the power of the Holy Spirit. Lord, even as we journey through the book of Acts, we pray that the Holy Spirit who ministered to the disciples, we pray that the same Holy Spirit will move among us and minister to us, to our hearts, Lord. Let this change, let this fire, the fire that carries revival be birthed in us. Let this fire stir us up, Lord, so that first it will impact us, so that we can impact others in our place, in our city, in our nation. Lord, let this cry be in us, Lord, as we read in Psalms 85 last week, O oh Father. Lord, help us to be the carrier of your revival fire. Revive us, Lord, so that we can be revived. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Holy Spirit, that you are ministering to each of us, Lord. Week after week, we pray and we seek you for more of you in us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you so much for joining in today's session. See you all in the next class. God bless. Thank you.